Okay, great. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming to uh, this event on the Russia-Ukraine war. I am Scott Gelbach. I'm a professor here in the Harris School and in the Department of Political Science uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, this is our latest event on the war sponsored by the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution uh, of Global Conflict and its Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. I believe it's our third such event at this point. Uh, our first event, some may remember, was on February 17th, precisely a week to the day from Russia's large-scale uh, um, scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. So it's a particularly apt time for us to take stock of events uh, over the last few weeks. We've seen a very successful Ukrainian counteroffensive in the northeast of the country. As Ukraine has regained territory, uh, there has emerged uh, new and horrific uh, evidence of Russian war crimes. Uh, the last couple of days, we've seen the beginning of a large-scale military mobilization of Russian civilians to replace Russian soldiers who were killed and wounded uh, in Ukraine, and a sham vote in occupied territories to facilitate the annexation by Russia. Uh, coincident with all of this, uh, there has also been, uh, quite disturbingly, some nuclear saber rattling by Vladimir Putin and others in the Russian government. So I cannot imagine a better group to discuss these issues than the one that we have with us uh, today. Uh, so let me introduce people uh, proceeding from uh, my left. Uh, Konstantin Sonin uh, is the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor here at the Harris School of Public Policy. Next to him is Natalia Shapoval, the Chairman of the Kiev School of Economics Institute and Vice President for Policy Research at the Kiev School of Economics. Next to her is Timofey Brik. Uh, Timofey is a sociologist and rector of the Kiev School of Economics. Next to him is Timofey Milovanov. Uh, Timofey is the president of the Kiev School of Economics and former minister of economy of Ukraine. Uh, and finally, last but not least, Roger Meyerson, the David L. Pearson Distinguished Service Professor uh, uh, here at the Harris School uh, and also the economics department in the college uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and a Nobel Prize winner in economics. So we're gonna proceed as follows. So we'll give each of our guests, each of our panelists five minutes to uh, uh, offer opening remarks. And uh, we're gonna try to uh, stick to that uh, pretty strictly so that we have time for uh, Q and A. We're gonna uh, wrap up at one o'clock or shortly after. Um, so Timofey Brink, why don't you um, why don't you lead things off? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be uh, in the U.S. and in your prestigious institution. It's been a couple of uh, very pleasant days for me because I have not traveled for a while. I, I stayed in Ukraine and Kiev for all these days, and uh, this is my first international travel. Um, I think I would like to have a very brief um, opening remarks. Uh, I would rather... Um, talked with you uh, to answer to your questions. As a sociologist, I can say that you know, my colleagues and myself, uh, we have uh, spent you know, a lot of efforts to understand Ukrainian society. We have accumulated a lot of data uh, through surveys, qualitative research, uh, field experiments. And nevertheless, we were even academics, people who supposed to know things. We were, we were quite surprised to see this uh, enormous response of Ukrainian society, and we still see it. Ukrainian society has uh, changed quite a lot in terms of uh, national mobilization, in terms of trust. We observe unprecedented trust to formal institutions, to parliament, to, to the president, which was, uh, we did not observe this before. And we still see uh, this resistance of Ukrainian society, despite, uh, you know, so many, um, so many shocks and uh, crises that people had to endure through. Uh, I can refer to some recent uh, uh, surveys. Um, there were plenty of surveys conducted even during the past seven months uh, throughout the invasion. So what usually uh, sociologists do now in Ukraine, they take samples, uh, large representative samples that existed before the invasion, and they try to contact the same people to sort of create panel data and contact the same people and ask them how, how their life changed. 
and one of these uh, research was recently published on Poners, which is a quite um, reputable website and uh, professional group that covers um, our region. And um, some of the numbers were quite shocking. Uh, there were surveys uh, that showed that, to, to give you an example, uh, a year ago, about 4% um, of respondents they uh, had war-related dreams. Now we're talking about 5% of respondents. Uh, a year ago, about 10% of respondents said that they feel anxiety and stress when they're alone. Now it's more than 30%. So the Ukrainian society has been affected by this war tremendously. More than 80% of respondents said that they know that they've been somehow exposed to war because they know someone who is at war or because they were relocated or because their jobs were affected. And more than a third of them said that they know personally someone in the family on friendship cycles to be fighting. So this war has uh, affected everyone in Ukraine very tragically. And nevertheless, we also see other figures that show that Ukrainians keep, you know, keep going. They, they believe in, in victory. They support their government. And uh, to me, the most important is that they support democracy. Uh, I can refer to many different surveys to the group of uh, Olga Onuch from Manchester, who is doing a lot of panel data in Ukraine, uh, Kiev Institute of Sociology, Razumkov Center, uh, anyway, uh, National Academy of Science. So whatever poll you take, you see increase in the support of idea of democracy and value of democracy. So I think this is a very good sign, and it gives us some optimism for Ukraine to go through this uh, uh, terrible, terrible uh, period and, and to be rebuilt. I will be glad to speak with you about it uh, more. I have a lot of uh, notes and data and references, so uh, I, I will let other people to speak now. Thank you. You brought the receipts. Okay. <laughs> Great. Natalia, Shapovalov. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Natalia Shapovalov. I'm from so uh, last week I was, uh, this week, uh, I was in uh, the United Nations General Assembly. We were meeting with different uh, participants of this assembly. And uh, there was, of course, a lot of discussion about the future. And uh, surprisingly, uh, when people talking about the future, many of them mentioned peace. And uh, what's striking how many meetings peace can have. And uh, what's the most important is that uh, uh, there are many countries that want to know just peace as appeasement. So let's stop it all and uh, not to, you know, people are dying, so let's stop it. If there is some kind of negotiation, then it would be peace, it would be okay. And it's totally different from uh, what uh, we uh, in Ukraine see as uh, peace. And uh, I think this uh, definition is important, and I'll start from, from that. So I think that uh, there would not be any peace unless uh, rapids are on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, because if they stay, they continue to do what they are doing now. And uh, so some figures, so we monitor damages to infrastructure at KC, and uh, this are around uh, $114 billion already uh, from the beginning of the war. Maybe somewhere here it will be just 10 or 10 billion, but in Ukraine it's uh, more than 144,000 of uh, buildings. Uh, of this, uh, maybe 25,000 will be in this large block buildings with many flats. So that's a sense of how many people lost their houses or whose houses were damaged. And uh, almost 1,000 of hospitals, 500 of um, kinder, children, educational facilities, like in the schools, kindergartens, etc. It's all damaged. And uh, uh, that's not the, I would say the worst. The worst is what's happening with uh, uh, people and uh, uh, human rights. So um, my colleagues uh, from like as they join Ukraine, they uh, report the war crimes, and they reported like they were talking to people. They reported nineteen thousand of the different war crimes, uh, and uh, the estimates right now that uh, Russian soldiers took uh, around uh, 
one to two million people of Ukraine to Russia. Uh, this uh, new filtration camps uh, is also there are estimated between 20,000 people to 100,000 people who are going through that. And something between 1.3 to 2 million children are being uh, uh, deported. No one knows exact figure because there is no access to uh, the occupied territories. And uh, all the international organizations who usually provide humanitarian orders, they tried uh, twice. Uh, it didn't work out, and they can okay. It's not the first time we failed another job. So, uh, being a Russian person needs to continue that. And uh, just to highlight that the eastern uh, regions where they started are specific Russian speaking regions. So, that was from a mother who's from Russia. It was uh, really strange. How come you would work with Russians by starting from Cuba specifically? Because the Russian, uh, Russian people in the um, And uh, that's the first one. So uh, it's critical that Russians are not on the territory of uh, uh, Ukraine anymore, uh, but also accountability and compensation for damages. I think these are critical things that should happen before there could be any meaningful uh, negotiation of uh, any meaningful peace. Thank you. That's Thank you, Natalia. So, hey, Milovana, if you were here with us on February 17th, the week before the Russian invasion, <clears throat> on February 20th, I believe, the following day, you, when it appeared that war was imminent, you flew back to Ukraine so that you could be in Ukraine before the uh, invasion uh, occurred. Where are we now? I think we're with the same. The, you want to need the mic? I'm sure. Right have, on the mic. The, the Zoom audience needs you to have the mic. Okay. So, but you have here, Ken. I think, uh, well, I, I think we're witnessing an independence war, a major independence war in, in the east of Europe. It's our natural inclination, as Natalia said, to search for peace immediately. But the peace in most people's mind, because we are coming, most of us, all of us actually are coming from the place of ignorance. To us, this means that we won't see the headlines and essentially regular military stops shooting at each other. If there's no shooting, if there are no tanks rolling through, if there is no you know, missiles, then we're good. But let's look at what Russia has done to Crimea over the last eight years. Also, relative peace in Crimea. They created incentives for the Crimean Tatars for ethnic Ukrainians and Greeks and other non Russians to live. Those who refused were deported, many. The leadership, especially the Crimean Tatars, was put in prison and they were moved out of Crimea to Russian prisons, and many have been tortured. They also brought up to 800,000 people from Russia. So they depopulated Crimea, and Russia is running population projects in their divided territories. That's the design. They are running major population depopulation and population projects. They do mobilization now, but where they are doing <clears throat> in different areas, right? In Buryat and Tatarstan, majority of people are coming from there, and for many people there, it's just the, the, the best opportunity to make a career in, in the Russian military because they are so poor and they don't have no education and no options. We have villages in the eastern Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine. Which were mobilized. And all names are dead. There's a village in which there was 53 names in Harkiv region. It was occupied, they were mobilized, they were sent to fight Ukrainians, regular troops. We killed them all. So they occupy our territories, mobilize our people, and force them to fight against us. 
That's an interim receipt power. Which now has run out of people and is trying to recruit people from the Far East, from Vladivostok, from the Arctic villages. <coughs> they also recruiting prisoners, right? We read it in the news and go laugh at this and say, oh, they're running out of uh, soldiers. They're not. They're recruiting prisoners because they want to recruit murderers and rapists. Those who do things which a normal human would refuse to do. It's not the Kremlin anymore. Today we have actually a machine which goes all the way from Kremlin to the recruitment to a lot of people who are issuing orders, pressing buttons, and sending missiles to blow up, as recently as the last week, a hydro dam in Kremlin which can flood and kill thousands or tens of thousands of people. This is a, a killing, a death machine. That, that's a technology that Russia has. And that technology is global. Because if you look at what Wagner has done, Wagner private group has done in Mali recently, where they tried to set up the French, well, that's not in the news, but if you Google it up, it will come up. I was shocked myself. Basically, the French troops had to give up a military base in a certain area. And the moment they transferred the base to locals, Wagner showed up, executed civilians, tied their hands, put them in the ground, and then started digging them up and setting up French military, that this is, you know, French military who committed crimes. French military recorded that from satellites and drones to protect themselves. Now, the pattern of tying hands up to the color of the day is consistent, at least that's now in this case, with the patterns that we have seen in Ukraine. You know, like a serial killer, People can kill others in many, many ways, but people do have patterns. I was not aware of that. A researcher just wrote to me, and then I started looking into this. So it's a global technology of terrorism, because we define terrorism as politically motivated torture and killings of non combatants. And to us, Peace means stopping this terrorism. Not having, not having the regular military stop shooting. And because we don't have any other mechanism to protect our civilians, except to make sure that Russian troops are not on the ground where our civilians are. That's why we demand and fight for Russia to leave Ukraine. What Russia tries to do in this discussion, Russia tries to argue that we are willing to make peace, just stop shooting and freeze it. That's the best solution. It is not because it will actually decrease the chances of survival of Ukrainian civilians in occupied territories. Right now, people who are being tortured have a chance of our military coming back. Once we get into a ceasefire, they don't. The chances are not high. There's no good odds. But they are there. The hope is there. That hope will be gone. We're doing unbelievably strategic things because we have to get through the news to you too. Because the way your administration operates through the political channels, not through the long-term strategy. They were reluctant to give us anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles a week before the invasion, while they were sure the invasion would be there. The problem would be which had we gotten those weapons two weeks in advance. We have to be clear about this. No one owes us a dollar or a single weapon. No one owes anyone anything in this world. But we need to understand the consequences of everyone's actions. It's a choice 
of the US administration, not to give us weapons before the war. And it is the choice made by the US administration to give us heavy weapons later. And there's always an excuse that we cannot be trained or there will be an escalation or we will fall anyway. And we have to prove time and again that this is not true. That we can be trained quickly. That we can, that teeth will not fall. That we can run successive, successful counteroffensive in Russia. And we have to do it in, in September, not in August. Although, you know, it's colder in Ukraine than it is here. There has been snow on the ground in some areas. Why do we have to do it in September? Because the Congress and the European Parliament are in, res in recess in Congress. Because it will not make the news. For all of this, we pay with lives. It's our independence war. We have fresh who were taken in Bucha or in Warsaw by the Russian troops in a base and held there without being given water for two weeks. She survived. She continues to study that the kids were done. This war matters, it's a global war. Why? Because we're already probably losing one or two percent of global growth because of this war. We're distracted from the climate change challenge. Large scale terror with respect to civilian population and destruction of infrastructure and throwing back the country, one country, but other countries too, decays, becomes normalized. These are global issues that have to be addressed by the world because what Russia has, been, has built is a machine similar to what, to what Germany had. Not to the same extent, not even close, not at the same scale, but the logic of the machine is the same. Don't play the right of a human to be free. Furthermore, impose on the bureaucratic mechanism to decide who's gonna live and who is not at large scale. They built, they have built a technology and they now have a country which is supporting this, a population. Not everyone, but a lot of people are supporting, or at least normalized. They consider it that to be normal because there's some story about neo-Nazis. There's some story about data expansion. There's some story about we are the one, one people, you know, there's, that is all irrelevant. Someone is given coordinates and someone is pressing buttons and people die and that is considered to be normal, but also by the world. So Russia is succeeding in normal life. Large scale terror, and that's a disease that's, that's existential to the human kind. So we have to be aware of this and we have to fight it. Very conscious. Because maybe not Russia, but that kind of issue in the human kind is an existential threat. So we need to learn how to create security framework that things like that don't happen. We all, all of us, we thought that we have learned from the World War II. We have learned from elements of genocide later. We have left everything in the previous century. No, it came back up like nothing in the future. And it made it into the future. Like nothing. So we don't want to answer any questions. That's a challenge for us. And we have to face the challenge rather than down the Thank you. So you all can watch us. If we stop holding these panels at some point, it will mean that we have normalized what's happening. But we're not going to stop. Uh, for those who don't know, yes. well, thank you for the interaction. I'm mm -hmm. glad we by the way. So mm -hmm. we keep them out almost without weapons from, from Kiev. We have run this extremely successful other attacks in Kharkiv against the second largest. And what is the fear in the US about the nuclear 
tactical weapons. That here is not in Ukraine. By the way, if all, someone have to be worried, that's us, not you. It's not, it's not gonna blow into your face. No? So it's up for us to decide whether to be afraid. And we are not afraid. We better face those risks than be tortured. And we can take them out on the battlefield. That's why they are terrorizing our civilians. Because they cannot face us in the military theater. Otherwise, they would have taken us over since this conventional military. It's an embarrassment for Russia because they cannot win using the conventional methods. They have to resort to terror, to propaganda, and to nuclear weapons threats. So it's for us to decide, not for you, whether to be afraid of this or not. And we are not afraid. It, the wind will not blow into your direction. By the way, it's not blowing into Russia. But uh, anyway, we have decent, very good military, very well motivated. We need your support financially, and we need your support in terms of weapons. Thank you. Good. So, um, for those who don't <clears throat> don't know, Konstantin Sonia has been a um, prominent public critic of the Putin regime for many years. Konstantin, you were in Russia on academic leave when the war began, um, quickly traveled back to the U.S. Help us to understand what is happening in Russia today. Yeah, I want to start. Is your mic on? Uh, okay, I wanted to start with the words of admiration for uh, my colleagues in the Kiev School of Kiev School of Economics, not only professors but students as well. I mean, long, uh, long before uh, before I joined the University of Chicago, my favorite example of scientist was the uh, most famous graduate of the University of Chicago. The students you might know, Indiana Professor Indiana Jones uh, is the more famous graduate of the University of Chicago, and he's a kind of a professor. I mean, nowadays we do not consider science what he does as anthropologist. I mean, literally taking artifacts from where they belong and bringing to museums. But he's also uh, actually fights fascism like uh, and there. So I thought that people, the guys at the Kiev School of Economics, they are actually doing this. They are doing economics, they're doing economic research, they teach students, they uh, advise the government, they uh, did massive, totally massive fundraising. They uh, provided a lot of information for everyone who listens, for media, for everyone, basically economic research, and simultaneously they were dealing, uh, dealing with the war. So I participated in a round table with Timothy uh, on February 24. So I, the day the war started, I came there. Of course, I was sort of uh, distraught and feeling out of place because in Moscow we had strong feelings, people who were against against the war. But of course, Timothy was literally on the bombs. He was uh, moving, not only was driving, and they were moving around Kiev watching the, um, the damage done by the Russian bombs, and he was simultaneously participating in the round table. Uh, okay, after the introduction, I, I think that uh, that I'll concentrate on Russia. I think that a lot of things uh, are changing in the world, and not only in the world. For example, uh, the University of Chicago still offers a uh, class uh, Russian civilization, Russian civ, and this is a popular class. I think this should be discontinued. That's a wrong thing to do. Like six months ago, Six months ago, we offered that the Center for Russian East Eurasian Studies that sponsors these events remove the word Russian from the title, but in six months, nothing changed. So perhaps we are not um, changing things enough, fast enough. It's also our own inertia. I think I'm uh, more positive about the prospects of Ukrainian um, military battle with Russia. Of course, there are a lot of lives of innocent people lost, but I do not think that there is any issue with the United States commitment. They will provide 
enough weapons, enough power uh, forever for Ukraine until the Russian army will be defeated. And like no question uh, that the Russian army will be defeated military in Ukraine. It's just uh, how long this war uh, will have, will be going and how many innocent civilians will will die. This is, this is a big issue, but I'm sure that there is no question about the ultimate outcome. Like if you uh, read, for example, the memoirs of Winston Churchill of World War II, basically uh, the outcome of the World War II was clear on December 7, 1941, when the United States entered the war, when Germans were defeated uh, close to, when it became clear that they're not taking Moscow, then it was four long years, but the outcome was clear. The same thing about, uh, about this war, there will be a lot of losses and pain, but of course, Russia will be defeated military. Actually, by now, Ukraine has the largest army in Europe. It's uh, Russia still has more artillery and more mobilization capacity, but the force is so much depleted that it actually has a smaller, uh, smaller armed forces than uh, than Ukraine. I think uh, for Russia, we are in the like final stage of. Um, Putin's uh, Putin's rule. I mean, it's it might be a long way, and he will get with him a lot of people to his grave. But I think he's totally on the like final countdown stage. Uh, unfortunately for Russia, I think the Russia's problem economic problems they are just starting. So Russia started like a descent from which I do not think that it will. It, I mean, it will never. It will, will never be back again as a uh, as a world power like Germany has never been back again as a world power uh, because uh, it's uh, clear that no economy in the world could grow and develop um, unless it participates in the international trade. I do not think there is any prospect that Western Europe or the United States would lift sanctions and let Russia to be a part of the international economic community unless it um, not only withdraws the um, uh, the troops and pay a huge amount of reparations, uh, but also gives up its uh, nuclear arsenal. And of course, this will be good for Russia as it was good for Germany to get rid of its army after World War II. I should mention, because Konstantin mentioned it, that the Kiev School of Economics has been doing uh, an enormous amount of, what to call it, philanthropic work since the start of the war, raising money to help uh, Ukrainian troops in the field, raising money to provide safe areas for Ukrainian students so that they can study in person and not online. So if you want to just take a moment and, and, and um, tell us, for those who might be interested, how we can make a contribution to that effort. Thank you. So maybe Mike works this stuff. I, no? is it... Okay, I'll use the other one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, we have raised about 35, 40 million dollars as of today for mostly humanitarian relief. We tried to address the issues which are present. In the first weeks of the war, we were actually doing political press. Because you know, the government during the war is cold. It's nightmare. It takes six or eight weeks to ship political press, which have been appropriated. Well, it is not even so appropriated, it's going to be used to be And then it takes six or eight weeks to ship it. Just to get government's expert control and time um, planes. And we needed a lot of good requests. You know, we needed that 60 planes, so full military cargo planes. You can only land several a day in Warsaw because you have to work technically in mean, Warsaw and closer to work. The logistics is a nightmare to do the work back. So we would work on that in the first of all, because people, you know, were killed because they didn't have more equipment. Then we moved into medical kits because students were being you know, shelled, and uh, most people were dying in the front line. Like, uh, not because it's just like, you know, 
and we sign a letter and send to other people out there. They all can survive because they're not the kid. And they sell, you know, all the disturbances within the next minute. So you have to have a lot of this name. Kids. And of course, we didn't have, so we just wanted to find 38,000 kids. Do you bring about that percentage of those kids? Um, then we moved into drones, so we uh, drones and some uh, ambulance, uh, and now we're in the long shot. The moment we got into some mm -hmm. big organizations like you said, we put that we don't, we don't, we don't even, you know, we just because we are faster and we are identifying it. So, right now, what the Ukraine needs is schools, we have 15,000 schools, large schools, they all need to have long shelters. No, no, some of them they, they can't they hear can't you. Control. Why don't I will switch one? So maybe, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll speak like this. Okay, so right now, yeah, you're good now. Let me see. Yeah. It just got echoey. Uh, try without the handheld this time. I uh, it's been going back and forth. I apologize. All right, so let me, let's try this one. Let me know if it it sounds like it's getting yeah. better. Okay. Yes. So, so I'll use this one. So basically, what we're doing right now, we want our kids to study offline. You know, we have great ballet school. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, maybe you have heard some of our older singers, singers and some of you've seen our ballet. They study online right now during the war. You, you know, our mathematicians and STEM schools, some of you know. All these schools are online because they don't have shelter. No shelter. And this is really a place in which we need to retrofit. It's like we don't need to, you know, it's a nice place to put the bio toilet there, you know, or a new door, I mean, in the ventilation system. And that would be as little as five to ten thousand dollars, and we will get, you know, several hundred people to study physically in the universe. That's just a big deal. That's a, you know, set of investments for the lower boundary, you not know, the general boundary. So that's what we are doing. Um, I was in the United Nations Educational Forum last week. There was a big, you know, UNES and UNICEF, everyone was talking about tens of millions of dollars that going to Ukraine. Someone came up with an innovative idea of multiplier for $14 million. And, you know, I was stupid enough to ask at the panel at the end of this, is that how, how much they have deployed amongst numbers seven in working? They said zero. Because they have come up with this innovative matching mechanism, which has to be approved by everyone. And so for the seven months, they are approving the innovative matching. Okay. So you have you have to move fast like we do. And then once these big whales come in, we have to come out. This, this is it's an interesting market market favor. But I, I don't know, it's like a separate panel. It's like there is a big market favor. Uh, by the time by the time we approve things for Afghanistan, Ukraine happens. Can we, I, sorry, yeah. Is it is there a website? Oh yeah, I have to do practical things. Yeah. Yeah, there was a website. It's the current uh website is safeeducation.ec.ua. Safe education school of economics.ua. You can donate. One dollar would be grateful. Okay. If you donate two to five to them, I'll find you a school and your name will be on the school, and everyone in that school will know that it's your money which helped them to study during the war. Uh, if you have people or foundations who are willing to donate more, and there are people who are willing to donate more, I have several million dollars being made with matching funds in the uh, and I can double the investment. So just you know, talk to me or give me an email or something. Would be very very great. We're trying to raise a million dollars that will help us uh, cover hundred schools. If we cover hundred schools, we will do a thousand. Fantastic. Thank you, Roger Meyerson. You have devoted your career to the study of strategy in different environments. How should we understand the strategic environment that? That, 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 of, of this war. I, I, yeah, let's say I, I'm glad to be here, not just with Timothy for the second or third time this, for the, this year, but also Natalia, who, and the two, I, I, my introduction to Ukraine was eight years ago in 2014, and we came, to, they, they gave me the greatest, the world's greatest tour of Kiev, but uh, 
it was uh, we were there to talk about uh, local government decentralization reforms, and I think part uh, a substantial part of why we've seen communities mobilized by the mayors and, and, and elected leaders to resist the Russians all over Ukraine in ways that look dramatically different from what we saw in April 2014 when when a few handful of, of ragtag separatists were able to subvert uh, the local governments of Donetsk and Luhansk um, is because of the decentralization reforms that we advocated. I'm not sure our advocacy made any difference. But uh, but it has made a but but reforms have made a huge difference. Uh, and, and but I think and I, the determination of the people of Ukraine to resist and to maintain their independence, if nothing else, we, have, we should acknowledge it because it hasn't been said that the member of the Hall of Honor that uh, the last time a Kremlin army came in uh, uh, 1918 to 1920 to try to enforce uh, Kremlin domination of Ukraine. It was followed within a dozen years by a uh, Kremlin-ordered policy that systematically uh, starved to death in, in the breadbasket of, of one of the breadbaskets of the world, uh, starved 10% of the population. Uh, and it, it's better it's better to do what, what, what uh, uh, to take the risks that, that, that Timothy uh, has described uh, than, uh, than to accept that again. I understand that, um, but I do, and I've cared about Ukraine since you brought me there, Timothy and Natalia, uh, eight years ago. But I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be the kind of person who cares and, and is prepared to fight for your independence to the last Ukrainian. Let, I, let, let's hope for a better future than that. Um, and I, when you think, uh, Scott, about, about strategy, I, ultimately we want to change ru what Russia does. We want Russia to accept Ukrainian independence. We want Russia to Russia. I, I I hope, and this is one of the questions I I I, I hope to hear Timothy and, and Constantine in particular talk about is uh, what might Russia's relationship with Ukraine look like in in, in a year uh, five or ten years from now. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, that makes a difference. Uh, the Chechens won their 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 war. For, uh, uh, for, for independence in 1996, and then a few years later, that, that was just arrested, and, and Putin, uh, uh, rising to the top in the Kremlin, uh, launched the, uh, the the Second Chechen War and destroyed it. We have to, uh, and I think in, even in, with a, a military victory of, of that was what we hope for, of where, where, where the Russian army is by the valor of arms of the Ukrainian arms is forced out of all Ukrainian territory. If there was that could be something that Vladimir Putin, as president of Russia, could live with if he then convinces the Russian people that uh, yes, he failed to take the territory that, that, that he promised them, but uh, but 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 his warnings that there all these these Western arms are creating a threat to, to, to Russian independence, and therefore the Russian people, if he has to if he persuades the Russian people that they now need to totally militarize their society to be ready for further uh, um, uh, uh, military threats from this, this, this dagger in the heart uh, that, that, that they can imagine Ukraine to be, uh, the, uh, that's not a piece we should welcome. And, and can, can we hope for better than that? Uh, I say this not just thinking that we should care about the long run. Let's, what the, I'm aware, they, they want to they want a bunch of game theorists up here, but this, this is, Mathematically comes, let's believe in rationality. And I'm aware that in talking about decisions in war, it is very, very difficult to have certain kinds of conversations. Uh, when the, when Russian, the Russian army is launching missiles casually all over Ukraine that kill people, uh, it's hard to talk about. Can you imagine a future when Ukraine is, uh, is friendly with Russia again? Russia again? I'm probably met many people have cousins. And hip laws and whatever across on one side of the border and the other. Um, no, it's hard to talk about that. But but a game theorist says, well, you know, an ideal rationality would. Um, deterrence takes two sides. It is like a scissors. You have to be able to convince your opponents, your adversaries, that if they behave badly, they will suffer punishment. They will get no benefit from it and suffer punishment. But you have to also convince them that if they stop. Uh, the punishment, 
they behave well, uh, then they'll, then they'll have a good life. <laughs> they, 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 can, they can be accommodated if they, if they stop their, their, their aggression. Um, in this, there's one thing I think it is essential to, to distinguish the reasons for the war from the Kremlin's perspective and from the Russian people's perspective. And Konstantin is, is our told them, I'm not thinking about this well enough, but I have to say, I surely believe, I think you probably could agree, that from the Kremlin's perspective, the, the reason Vladimir launched this war ultimately the most important is because a successful democratic Ukraine would be would make it much more difficult for him to rule Russia as an autocrat. But can't sell the war to the Russian people based on the idea that if we don't destroy Ukraine, the Ukrainians might start giving new ideas that we should have more accountable government in Moscow. That's not easy. So we can sell it on territory, we can sell it on, on manifest destiny and expansion, and we can certainly sell it based on a, on, on a story that NATO expansion into Ukraine is, is, a, is a dangerous threat to, our, to, to destroy our society. The, the Ukrainian army is not be very careful not to use weapons in ways that harm, uh, they're not using American weapons to strike, to strike the, 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 the recognized territory of Russia at all. And if they're using the Soviet weapons or other weapons they got elsewhere, they're being very careful not to harm civilians in Russia. There is no threat to, to, to Russia, but that needs to be conveyed. Surely this is not just about building a better future. Surely the Russian people would be worse off as a result of a Russian victory, and certainly, they they, uh, they can be better off having Ukraine as a neighbor, as a peaceful democratic neighbor. And that could have a difference right now if they understood it, they could get that message. Um, because their will to continue the war, their will to continue supporting Vladimir Putin and his Kremlin uh, uh, elite in, in, in this effort. Uh, depends on the fears that the, 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 the Kremlin has, has stoked about, about has, has, has tried to inculcate in, in the people of Russia about this. Those are lies, it's hard to get past the, the, but the Ukrainian army has had magnificent breakthroughs on the battlefield. And I can't help thinking that perhaps the, the leaders of, of the West and, and, and the leaders of Ukraine can find some way to break through the, 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 the fortifications of the Russian state media to, to begin to, to reduce the will of the, of the Russian people to support this terrible war. Roger, just to clarify your just to clarify your argument. So you would suggest that like in February 1945, uh, Roosevelt negotiates with Hitler a peaceful solution. Just worrying that Hitler doesn't uh, have to explain to German people. Uh, yeah. In the late years of World War II, the, the West, the policy, the Allied policy of unconditional surrender, was some was was controversial, and I and, and my argument definitely would be a, would be criticizing that would be among those who would say, and uh, the, the German will in 1918 to serve. So the, the German protesters and people who brought down the Kaiser in 1918 saying, Woodrow Wilson will take care of it now because Woodrow Wilson had articulated his principles that looked good. Woodrow Wilson then totally failed to implement those principles in, in effect. Uh, but one could, one could argue, and I, I might guess that, uh, that the, the official American, British, and I think the Russian uh, policy of German unconditional surrenders is how World War II has to end uh, was not sufficiently. Uh, reassuring to the German people, of course, the Germans did fight together. The Germany lost after being occupied by the Russian army, the American army, and the British army, uh, not by uh, a, a negotiated surrender. Roger, by the uh, Ukrainian army, yeah, so uh, actually. Uh, yes, well, so I stand for it. Certain seconds, you can type me. Certain seconds, please. Three zero. 30 seconds. Okay, so first of all, it was a Ukrainian who raised the Soviet Union flag on the right side. Ukrainian. Ukraine was important for the war. We lost maybe the majority of people in this war, as well as Russians did. Second, 
this argument is okay if there is a communication channel to the Russian people. We don't have that communication channel to the Russian people today. Third one is if we want to communicate something, I would to, to discourage them from war, I would say much more effective would be to communicate that they're gonna die, lose arms and you know parts of their body if they go. There's real evidence for that, that they come back in terms of thousands. And if NATO is a threat, then Russia should redirect its forces towards Finland and Sweden right now, away from Ukraine. Okay, thank you. Listen, let's say we have about 10 minutes left. We're gonna go five minutes over. We're gonna do this as follows. So we have about a hundred people in the room. We have a lot of people online. We're gonna to get to a few questions. We're gonna take them in pairs. We'll take one from the audience here uh, at the Harris School, and then one from the online audience. And then we'll have a quick response by our panel. We're gonna to try to get through as many questions as we can. If you have a question, I ask you to limit your question to 15 seconds or less, okay? And only one point. So please, over here. Evidently, the Biden administration, evidently the Biden administration has chosen not to provide Ukraine with sufficient long range weapons that Ukraine could swiftly oust Russian forces from Ukraine for fear of a nuclear escalation. But isn't this really wrong headed that it really is to uh, demonstrate that Russia can successfully, and it has successfully used nuclear threats to deter the United States. So uh, should the policy be to, to bring about a quick defeat and then hope that that quick defeat would be so humiliating to Putin that he would lose power in Russia. So it should be compared with presenting a vision for how Russia, for example, could be brought into the European Union and get great prosperity. Good, thank you. Emily, do you have a question for us from the online audience? I do, yes. One, my, oh. we give them two more, okay. This is from Dennis. Um, he's asking, how do you assess the economic cooperation between Russia and China in the sphere of recent events? Okay, good. So economic cooperation between Russia and China. And then we have a question about the Biden administration has reportedly been trying to, to boil the frog. So to increase assistance gradually so as not to provoke a response, is that the wrong strategy? So who would like to address either of those? I could, I could do China. Uh, okay, uh, the, the, there is no uh, like any kind of specific uh, cooperation between China and Russia, I mean, China takes any advantage that the situation provided. Basically, every Chinese from every bank, they have just their um, margins of trade on each trade increased. So Russian oil sold with discount, all the products are bought at a higher price, but there is no specific uh, new cooperation between China and Russia. What about the gradual increase in Western assistance to Ukraine? Um, I want to address a very specific subset of the question about vision for Russia, uh, like the European Union, etc. Uh, I think that uh, Russian people don't need uh, more propaganda from someone else, uh, like from Ukrainians showing them a better way of how we can become friends, or from Europe or from anyone else. I think uh, at this point, uh, they, after 30, 40, 70 years, of thoughts that are being put in their heads, they need some rest. Uh, on the oil and the frog, I think you're absolutely correct. There's this fear of nuclear or some other retaliation. And that actually undermines the concept, as you pointed out, of nuclear deterrence, because deterrence is also from the US side. If Russia can succeed at putting threats of nuclear something to achieve its objectives then it means the security framework is not working and it means they can do other things in other places down the road we're going to live in a very different world now if russia uses it we're also going to live in a very different world russia will be completely isolated and dismantled but i think we should not be afraid of Russia because we lose when we get afraid. Okay, let's take another pair of questions. Um, over here, please. 
Thank you. Uh, first off, Slava Ukraine. Uh, we, we have no doubts that Ukraine will win. And uh, my question is, um, this uh, Ukrainian victory on the battlefield will definitely lead to the end of Putin's regime. And one of the scenarios for Russia after the war is disintegration. How Ukraine and the world uh, is planning to control this territory or help this territory to not to destabilize uh, inside of it, create more terror, more uh, uh, chaos uh, and uh, Actually, I, I hope that uh, there are thoughts about it already. Thank you. Good, and let's take a question online. This is from Rick. He asks, what does the panel make of the recent exodus of Russians? Is it significant? And also is Russia on the verge of becoming more like North Korea, more isolated, or is Putin on the verge of being displaced? Okay, so these are related questions. What comes next in Russia? What happens in Russia after the war? And what are the consequences uh, of the huge exodus of, of Russians, uh, again, from the country? Um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that this will be a sign of increased in influence of Ukraine, if you really think about what how you would secure peace on the Russian territory, because I think Putin basically created created all the conditions for an internal civil war. So now there are hundreds of thousands of people who, are, who have uh, real military experience. They're basically handing out weapons to private companies, regional brigades. So I would expect a civil war, not perhaps disintegration of Russia, but a sort of civil war like in some cities in the 90s. So I wonder what you think, how would you secure your, your neighbors? Timothy? Yeah, I have a few quick thoughts. I think uh, uh, you will be surprised that uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians now are quite indifferent toward, towards Russia. I think they will face, Russia will face a lot of problems, but as Natalia said, I think they need some rest and maybe Ukraine doesn't need to intervene and, uh, and, um, and we need to care more about what will happen with Ukraine and how to restore Ukraine. We from what I see in the, in the discourse and uh, dominant narratives in Ukraine, there could be some sympathy to ethnic minorities in Russia because we share these anti-imperialistic uh, narratives now uh, against the you know the domination of Russian regime that suppresses uh, ethnic minorities. There could be some sympathy towards uh, certain ethnic minorities, but I don't think that Ukrainians would would care much about about Russia after Russia loses the war. What do you think? Should we take one more pair of questions? Sorry, one more pair. Sorry, uh, Roger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, sure. uh, it's, it's frightening to hear that that can actually be excellent answer. Given the, the, the previous questions, but in some ways, what we're talking about is the possible a possible future in which the 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 the, the big lie. Russian state uh, um, allegations that the, 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 the West might be and, and Ukraine interfere and, and dominate Russian, Russia as a nation. Uh, there's some suggestion that that might happen because of, the, of what they've done. That they may draw in with it, where I'm, where not because of Western or Ukrainian intent, but because of the disastrous impacts of the policies that, that, that have been launched by the Kremlin. That's right. So just so, so we know, there is thinking, there is there is thinking going on. I'm mean, just like it's not public, but of course uh, it's gonna take the world. That was the leadership of the U.S. probably to contain the situation post-war. And there is serious thinking going on, including probably I don't know, but I would imagine, I would guess there are already some negotiations with some generals and such and. Uh, Maybe this prisoners exchange and other routes are allowed to build some trust at the medium command level. So I think people are thinking about this, it's just not us, you know. And I don't, I have not been briefed, I don't know any information. Obviously, I'm saying it's a speculation, but I think I, you know, I would be surprised. Okay, one more pair of questions. Yes, okay. 
over here. Yeah. I, I don't need anything more online. Uh, no, so let's take you in the room. Then. So since the beginning of the war of the invasion, uh, hundreds of thousands of Russians have been trying to flee uh, flee the country, and even more so now uh, that partial mobilization has been announced. At the same time, uh, some European nations have enacted uh, uh, visa bans. Um, and my question uh, for the panel, therefore, is: uh, Do you think that uh, visa bans should be maintained, or that uh, Western democracies should, on the other hand, try to? Um, favor uh, actually uh, these uh, uh, Russians that are trying to flee uh, the war and the conflict as a way to uh, erode support for uh, uh, Putin and its war. There's a question there about what the goal should be, right? And if the goal is to somehow yeah. undermine a Putin regime, is it better to encourage exit or encourage voice? Let's take one more question up here. Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks to people from Kiev School of Economics for coming. Uh, and yes, yeah. uh, I'm from Moscow, Russia. Uh, I think January of 2022 might have been the last time of my life when I went to Russia. Uh, my pessimistic um, yeah, uh, thoughts. Uh, I wanted to ask, though, I have a lot of friends in Russia that cannot go, uh, well, uh, fly out of there just because, I don't know, many parents of, the, of those people are... I don't know, maybe not pro-Putin, but they're definitely not going to leave. A lot of very sad stories. And uh, a lot of, maybe not a lot of those people, but some will definitely consider, um, they, they'll have two options. Uh, option number one is going to prison. Option number two is uh, being uh, mobilized. Uh, I want to know, I want to ask you, um, do, do we have any data on people who are, uh, I don't know how do you say that, like, give, Surrender, uh, people that surrender. Uh, I, I'm sure people that surrender uh, that are in Ukraine are treated uh, much better than they were treated in the Russian army. There's no doubt in that. But what is the uh, six? Do we have any idea about the success rate? Uh, I'm like people who try to surrender, and I, I'm sure some people might get killed accidentally. Uh, and yeah. Well, I mean, thanks. People are leaving Russia, morale, the Russian army by inference and by evidence, therefore, must be quite low what's happening to Russian troops who are serving and what are, are they surrendering and what happens then. Okay, and we have this, this earlier question as well about what should be the optimal policy of the EU vis-a-vis -vis Russians who are, are, are leaving the country so as to avoid mobilization. Exit of wars. Ukraine has chosen voice. Eight years ago, our secret police and uh, riot police they were shooting our protesters in 2013. We are the country which has evolved in eight years from the state in which we did not have our own government. And our own government was shooting protesters and they were willing to die. And we kicked that guy out and his cronies from the country. And now we're fighting the second largest military in the world. That can be done in eight years. You've, you're really observing a, a, a serious evolution of a state towards democracy on, on, on historical, of historical proportion. So Russia can do that too. Exit will not build Russia. Ukraine would, can't, would not have been what it is now, if it were designed and built from outside. So it must have been voice in mind. That's where the tally shot So, yeah, first I want like a disclaimer. I don't think that like passport or any like geographic location where the person was born can 100% identify a person. But uh, I think for some people that uh, happens, and that's why we are in segregation in Russia, as uh, uh, people who believe in the combined propaganda of this foreign machine. So, after this disclaimer, I think specifically the problem of uh, this Russia is that people are not willing to take responsibility for themselves and not willing to cooperate with others to solve these problems. Like that should be a, like a basement for democracy. But they get together and solve kind of issues that they cannot solve on their own. And uh, I think that's kind of 
think that it should be happening, and it's aligned with what you can basically say that it should be voiced, people should be like guessing and finding something in common and solving the problem, not finding, not searching for a way how exactly to avoid the problem. Okay. Unfortunately, I think we need to end our discussion. We look forward to the rapid and successful conclusion of the war. We hope to not have to have many more of these panels, but thank you everybody for coming out today and thank you to the members of our panel.